Hello and welcome to season seven of the Buffy and the Art of Story podcast, a podcast that recaps one episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer at a time, focusing on its story elements. Today, we're looking at season seven, episode three, same time, same place, where Willow returns to Sunnydale, but she and the gang can't find one another and a demon attacks. I am Lisa M. Lilly, mystery and thriller author and story expert. If you'd like to get more Buffy in the Art of Story content and support the podcast, you can do that at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lilly. That's L-I-S-A. M is in Marie, L-I-L-L. Why? Along with the recap of Same Time, Same Place, today we'll talk about the role of coincidence in story, keeping scenes engaging while showing them twice, what happens when the rules of the world are unclear to the audience, pacing problems, and many, many metaphors. As always, there will be no spoilers until the end when I talk about foreshadowing. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Same Time, Same Place aired the first time on October 8, 2002. It was written by Jane Espenson and directed by James A. Contner. Unlike the first two episodes of Season 7, this one does not start with a prologue. We go right into the action. I will give a short prologue to the podcast episode, though, just to say that I am so excited to talk about this with you because this feels like where season seven really starts. The previous two episodes felt to me like they were just setting the stage, but now Willow is back in Sunnydale. At the same time, despite all the fantastic scenes in this episode, each time I watch it, and on the first time I watched it, I've had this lingering feeling of maybe disappointment or frustration. I always want to like it so much more than I do, and I never got why until I broke it down for the podcast. So let's take a look. The episode starts with a close-up on an old-fashioned clock with a clock face, and the time is 9.24. We're in the Sunnydale airport. The passengers deplane. One of them drops a jacket. Someone else almost trips on it. And Buffy, Dawn, and Xander wait. Xander's holding a sign that in yellow crayon says, Welcome Willow, which Buffy thinks Willow might have a little trouble reading because the lettering is so light. Dawn asks Xander to tell them again what he said to Willow. He goes right into it and then stops realizing she is teasing him. And Buffy says they heard the crayon speech a few times, not that it wasn't great. And Xander says, I saved the world with talking from my mouth. My mouth saved the world. Now we get a little more exposition through minor conflict among the friends and internal conflict that comes out in their gestures and what they say because they are all apprehensive about Willow. This is a great way to remind the audience what happened last season. Buffy and Dawn are both unsure what to say when they first see Willow. Xander says he'll say, hi, Willow. But Buffy points out they saw Willow kill someone and Willow was about to kill Dawn. She doesn't mention that Willow also was trying to kill Buffy and destroy the world. Xander says Giles wouldn't have let Willow come home from England unless she finished that recovery course or whatever she was doing. And that's when Buffy admits that Willow didn't finish all the training. Dawn now says she didn't finish. She didn't finish not being evil. Buffy tries to reassure Dawn that Giles said it was really important that Willow come to Sunnydale and Willow was doing well. At that moment, Xander notices that all the passengers are gone and there is no Willow. This is two minutes into the episode and there is tons of conflict and tension already. And we might think this was the moment that sets off the main plot, but we are going to get even more conflict because 
The clock again appears in close up with the same time. The same passengers walk out of the plane. One drops that jacket, another almost trips. This time, though, Willow is in the line with them, but there's no Buffy, Xander, or Dawn. Willow looks around and sadly says, Welcome home, me. This is a terrific story spark or inciting incident for the emotional subplot of the story, which is Willow reconnecting with her friends or hoping to and fearing rejection and them wanting to reconnect with her, but fearing she might pose a danger. It's only two minutes, 50 seconds in, and we're going to credits. And after we're going to get the story spark for the demon plot. On return from the credits, we see a young man spray painting an unfinished wall in a construction site excavation. A disembodied sing-song voice in the dark almost whispers, all alone. Are you frightened to be all alone? And the guy looks around. He yells at whoever it is that's there, and something attacks him at 4 minutes, 22 seconds. That is almost exactly 10% through the episode, and typically you'll see a story spark there if it hasn't happened already. So we've already gotten three inciting incidents. Buffy and Xander don't find Willow. Willow doesn't find Buffy and Xander. And this attack. The scene cuts to the darkened Summer's home. Willow enters, calls out for Buffy. Nobody's there. The camera briefly pans to the microwave and the time is 10.41. I love this use of clocks early on. So in case we didn't quite catch that first time that the time was the same, we see it here because we'll see this microwave clock again. Willow goes upstairs into her room. I never quite picked up on whose rooms were whose in the episode until I read the Buffy fandom wiki. It's buffy.fandom.com slash wiki if you want to check that out. This is her old room with Tara and the clothes on the bed and the photographs tell us that it that Buffy now lives there. I never pick that up. I just saw it as Willow going to her room and it'll matter later because I'll be confused again. She looks out the window where that gunshot came through last season. She hears the sound of the shot and glass breaking and herself saying, Tara, I love this very fast flashback. And I find it very believable that Willow stands there for a moment. She backs off and that she doesn't turn on any lights, though it is fairly dim throughout the house. It reflects how Willow's feeling. This is where she looks at the photos that are displayed, and it is mostly Buffy with various friends. And then she looks at a planner open on the desk, and it says family numbers, and there are names and phone numbers there, but not Willow's. Something else I didn't really pick up on in previous watches. I probably thought that was Willow's planner, so I didn't get that this is another reason Willow feels so isolated. She's afraid she is not among Buffy's friends and family anymore. She hears a door slam downstairs. She drops the planner, runs down the stairs. Her boots are clunking on that hardwood, uh, the hardwood stairs and the hardwood floor. There's no one there, and Willow curls up on the couch alone. Alone. In the next scene, Buffy, Xander, and Dawn enter the house, and the clock again on the microwave shows 1041. Now we get a fill in the blanks of sorts of what happened when Willow walked in and was upstairs. And I love the way the writers create these scenes so that there is enough to tell us even absent the clocks, that it's the same scene, but different dialogue is highlighted. There is doubling of certain things, but enough is changed and there's enough insight into the other point of view that we stay really engaged. And there's another scene later that does that so well. 
Buffy, Xander, and Dawn are talking about how Giles told Buffy he put Willow on the plane in London. They guess that she could have gotten off at Chicago. I always love the little mentions of Chicago in the show. There are very few, but I have a little yay there for my home city. They also speculate Willow could have doubled back and returned to London. And Dawn says, well, if she's doing that, ducking Giles, then she's evil, right? Xander points out, well, I've avoided Giles tons of times just meant I was lazy, not evil. Buffy responds, I hope you're right, because defeating Lazy Willow, probably less hard. More terrific exposition reminding us of the danger Willow poses and letting us know where the friends are in this episode. Dawn is very worried. Xander has faith in Willow, always ready to say, let's not jump to conclusions without literally saying that. And Buffy, hopeful yet realistic. They check the phone messages. There's nothing from Willow. Xander shuts the door. So that's that door slamming Willow heard. And then they hear a noise from upstairs, which is when Willow dropped the planner. They go upstairs, find nothing and no one, and the scene cuts to a commercial. On return, our friends sit in the living room, two of them, on the couch where Willow was lying down. And this is tricky because on so many watches, my brain grappled with, okay, they can't see each other, but it isn't that they're invisible to each other because then they would run into Willow on the couch and they would hear Willow's boot heels on the floor, yet they do hear a door slamming and a planner dropping. And later we will get an explanation of that, but it, it kind of nagged at me starting with here, oh, what are the rules here? And that's okay, you can have a world that has different rules. There are different rules now because of what we'll find out is a spell. But later on, I have some questions whether those rules are consistent. For now, Buffy is saying she checked with Giles again. He's blaming himself like he should have known that Willow wasn't ready for this. And Buffy says she told Giles it's not his fault. Maybe there's something about them, meaning Buffy and her friends, that Willow couldn't face. Xander says Willow might have thought they weren't ready to forgive her. And Dawn says, so Giles is blaming Giles and we're blaming us. Is anyone going to blame Willow? Buffy gives her a look and Dawn says, oh, don't give me shock face. I mean, will anyone around here ever start asking for help when they need it? Clearly a dig at Buffy. Maybe at Xander as well for not talking to his friends about his concerns before he left Anya at the altar. As it goes to Buffy, it throws me a bit because Dawn and Buffy reconnected. They seem to have worked through their issues from last season, which, which makes me think this is a this season thing that Dawn has seen something where she thinks, okay, Buffy still won't reach out. And all I can think of, it's because Buffy didn't tell Dawn about seeing Spike in the basement. That's probably it, given Joss Whedon's DVD commentary, where he said Buffy's up to her old tricks of hiding things. But this is one example of where when the reference doesn't land, it gives the audience's mind more to think about rather than following the story. That may just be me that that reference doesn't immediately connect up or that I'm expecting it to be more than just a reference to season six. Buffy agrees that it's on Willow if she decided not to show up. They can only be there for her if she's there. The next morning, Willow awakens on the couch. Very sunny, but nobody is home. She tries to call Giles and learns he's in an all-day watchers council meeting. She doesn't leave a message, which I believe because Willow might not want to talk about how sad she feels and how her friends might have rejected her. Here is my issue though with the whole setup, which is the phones clearly work between London and the United States. The friends use the phones. It isn't a thing of, oh, it's way too expensive to call. Why would Willow and her friends not talk on the phone before Willow comes back? I 
guess you can make an argument for they all want to see each other in person or Willow's afraid that she's going to call and they're going to say, don't come home. I would have liked to see that last episode. We had some repetitive scenes last episode. We will have them again here. And it would have helped if we knew that there's a reason they didn't just pick up the phone and talk to each other. At 10 minutes, four seconds into the episode, Willow goes to the burned out magic box. Anya exits carrying a box of salvaged items. And we get some more great conflict which brings out exposition Anya says what are you doing here I thought you were studying with Giles how not to kill people Willow says I just got back and Anya asks what everyone wants to know just got back as in you're all better or just got back to bring a fiery apocalypse of death Willow says neither really but she's studying working hard and she will be better. Anya thinks that's great, but she remembers the last time Willow said she was better. Anya spent a long time cleaning out the debris of her ex-livelihood since then. Willow clearly feels bad about that. She says she wants to help in any way she can and goes on, I feel really responsible. Anya, so terrific here. So very Anya says, you feel really responsible? You are really responsible. Willow apologizes and Anya tells or here's something you should know about vengeance demons. We don't groove with the sorry. We prefer, oh God, please stop hitting me with my own rib bones. Willow tells her to go on and say whatever she wants, that Willow deserves it. And Anya says, and you won't mind? Willow shakes her head and, and Anya says, well, then that's no fun. I love this back and forth. We do get not new information, but more reminders of things that happened last season, particularly Fiery Apocalypse, destroying the magic box. And I like that Willow has to reconnect with everybody. And Anya, she's not as frightened about connecting with Anya. Anya is more forthright, which might make it easier because Willow feels bad and she can address that and say yeah I feel bad I deserve whatever you say that's all great it's also a bit repetitive because we have gotten much of this already we're more than 10 minutes into the episode and we're still reminding viewers what happened before even that I might be fine with because it's done in such engaging ways except that later there will be what feel like filler scenes to me. Taken together with all the extra exposition, it makes this episode, which should be so gripping as our friends struggle to reunite, and that has so much emotion behind it, it robs it of some of its power. Willow sits on the curb and sighs and Anya after a moment sits next to her. A very nice moment of offering a bit of support despite everything Anya said. Willow asks where everyone is these days and Anya talks about how she went to Brazil the other day for vengeance and she goes on making it sound like she is having a blast as a vengeance demon. Willow asks about the others and says she hasn't seen them. Anya guesses they're still mad at Willow. They're a little temperamental these days and she starts to allude to last week and the worm demon but Willow cuts in to ask again about Xander and Buffy. Anya tells her they're all about the high school now. Xander is there working on construction. Spike is insane in the basement and Buffy is counseling teens. This sets up a very funny line and it's information Willow needs, but it is also information we all know from two episodes of seeing it. Willow says, wait, Spike's what in the whatment? And Anya replies, insane base filling in the blanks for her at 12 minutes 44 seconds willow goes to the construction site calling out for xander when she gets no answer she climbs down the ladder into that excavation we are now approaching the one quarter twist the first major plot turn that typically comes from outside the protagonist and spins the story in a new direction it often raises the stakes as it does here and it is a ways past one quarter, which is more common in TV shows than in novels. Willow sees a flayed body. It looks very much like Warren did when she flayed him. 
And this is the next point where diving into the story this way, I realize that I felt a lot of letdown because Buffy as a show is so creative and imaginative. These are such great writers, but this plot rests on this huge coincidence that on the day that Willow comes home, when she hasn't talked to anyone and she hasn't finished her training and One of the big things she did was flay Warren alive. Just coincidentally, a demon turns up in Sunnydale that flays people. You can for sure use coincidence in a story. You can use it to set off a story because then it's the inciting incident. A coincidence happens and the story is not about the coincidence. It's about how everyone deals with that. And there's, you know, a little of that here, but this is a major turn in the story, and it's a coincidence. You also generally, readers will be very disappointed if you resolve a situation through a coincidence. So antagonist, protagonist working really hard toward their goals, and a coincidence happens that fixes everything for them or resolves the conflict. And it's hard to believe because in real life coincidences do happen but in story it feels a bit like a cheat this is somewhere in between so it's it's not solving anything it's complicating things further for willow and for the gang because they are now going to worry that willow did this but my brain just struggles with, huh, wow, what are the odds? And we've never seen this kind of demon before. Sure, Buffy introduces new demons all the time, but there are going to be some more things too. Coincidentally, spells don't work on this demon. We'll find out. So that's another handy coincidence. And again, it's not solving anything, so it isn't as problematic. It's making things harder, but it is a lot to stack up and buy that this demon is just the perfect demon to have enter the world of Buffy when Willow returns. I do love how the doubling of the scene happens because we see Willow looking like she's about to throw up seeing this flayed human being lying on the ground and the camera pans from her past the body into Buffy and Xander. We have a comment from friend of the show, Stephen Yunkin, the host of the Angel Retrospective podcast, Wolfram and Cast. He is talking about the Buffy in the Art of Story episode on Lessons, the pilot of season seven. And he says, enjoyed your analysis of the episode. Personally, I think you were much kinder to the episode than I would have been, especially when seen in light of the entire season. I should pause here. Um... There are spoilers of a sort here in terms of what doesn't happen. If you really don't want to hear that, I would just skip forward a bit till the comments are over. Stephen goes on, especially when seen in the light of the entire season, this episode promised a lot more than would ultimately be delivered. In fact, the episode almost feels like an alternate version of season seven than what we got. First, the introduction of John's friends and making her the focus of the story. That made the episode feel almost like a backdoor pilot for a Dawn spinoff series. That would have been fine, and the time spent on her friends is similar to the time spent on Willow and Xander in Welcome to the Hellmouth. The difference, though, is that Willow and Xander did return and become critical characters while, as far as I can recall, Dawn's friends never returned after this episode. Unless a character has an impact on that episode or future episodes, a writer should not waste precious TV time on them. Likewise, the use of the school. Joss had commented that he regretted leaving the high school after season three because that was where he originally envisioned all of the adventures being around. But because of the actor's aging, he had no choice but to graduate them. So this felt like his chance to return and do the stories he enjoyed. However, like Dawn's friends, 
that also got abandoned. In fact, the high school wasn't even important other than a few key moments, such as making use of the Hellmouth after episode six. Thus, they again got away from high school as being a setting, though this episode implied it would play as important of a role as it did in seasons one through three. Finally, the final scene with the return of all the big bads. While I absolutely love that sequence, any chance to see Harry Groner come back as Mayor Wilkins gets an ultimate thumbs up from me, it also felt like a promise the show never followed up on. Other than Juliet Landau and Adam Bush, they were never able to bring back the other actors for future episodes. Just imagine how much fun the show would have been had we been able to see, I'm going to skip a little here, uh, those actors and characters again. But as I said, it never followed through on the promise of this episode, which ultimately makes the episode a letdown. Stephen makes great points here all this time in the high school. I'm pretty sure he's right that it ultimately does not make that much difference to the overall story arc. I will watch for that as we go through season seven. But thinking about it, yes, it for sure is a location where things happen. But I don't think there is that much that really turns on the fact that it is the high school. This episode illustrates some of that. The high school is used as a setting, the construction site, Spike in the basement, but Spike could have been in the basement of any building. The construction site could have been anywhere. It's convenient that everybody's in this same place, but it it really doesn't have to be the high school. And Dawn apparently just doesn't go to school. Maybe maybe she is at school at some point, and that's why we don't see her with Xander and Buffy now. But we don't see her go to school. I'm not saying I want to because it doesn't have anything to do with this story, but that's Stephen's point. It doesn't have anything to do with this story, and that will be the case with many episodes. Thank you, Stephen, for the comment. It was on the Buffy and the Art of Story Facebook page. If any of you would like to comment, feel free to pop over there and share your thoughts. Xander says, I found it first thing this morning. I gave my crew the day off and I called you right away. And Buffy says, I got to get a job where I don't get called right away for this stuff. Nice way to quickly explain why no one else sees this body. They now hear clanking from the direction of the ladder, glance over and see nothing. The audience sees a quick shot of Willow breathing hard and climbing the ladder out. This is not consistent with at the house where Willow clunked down the stairs in her boots and Buffy and Xander did not hear that, but now they hear her clunking up the ladder. I can headcanon it, and maybe if I slowed it down and looked frame by frame, I'd see that the sound maybe is because the ladder is shaking because it seems everyone can hear things objects that are moved by the other people but can't actually hear the person so we can't hear willow's boots but we can hear the ladder rattling the trouble with that is my brain now is thinking about that it's not as engaged with the story and that is tricky when you're creating rules that you have to create to go with the story If they don't always fit or they don't fit really neatly or it's not clear that they fit really neatly, you're taking up your audience's brain space. Xander says he knows what Buffy's thinking. Maybe Willow is back and we cut to a commercial. Next is the scene I always remember from this episode. It's what makes me love the episode. Willow walks the halls of Sunnydale High and she finds Spike in the basement. He leaps in front of her, tells her she needs a special permission slip with a stamp to be there and turns away. Probably he thinks she isn't real. He keeps raving and then he stops and he turns so he's his side is to Willow. He's looking forward and he stands very still and silent. Then he steps a little forward and says, you went away. You've been gone since. And Willow, thinking he's talking to her, 
says she's back and tells him about the body. Spike says, tragedy. Looks at Willow. He has to turn his head to the side to do that and asks, is there blood? Willow tells him she can't find anyone and then tells him the victim was skinned. What could do that? Spike looks at her again and says, you did it once. I heard about it. Willow, looking super uncomfortable, says anything other other than me? Spike looks forward again, steps forward again, and says, look at you, glowing. What's a word means glowing? Got a rhyme. But then he cringes away and says he should hide and says, you know what I did. Willow now is confused and says he didn't do anything, did he? Spike now catches on and says everyone's talking to him, but no one's talking to each other. He concludes someone isn't there and says, button, button, who's got the button? My money's on the witch and looks straight at Willow. On first watch, this scene was so powerful because we don't know that Buffy and Xander are there. It seems like much more of Spike's dialogue is raving than is really the case, as we'll find out in the next scene. And this is done so well. At 16 minutes, 30 seconds, Buffy and Xander walk those basement halls. Xander comments on the blueprints not making sense down there. It's like the walls move. They hear Spike raving. They don't see Willow. And they walk in and he steps forward and says those lines about you went away. Buffy thinks he's talking to her. And I'm pretty sure he is at that point. And she tells him he scared her a little at the church. They're confused when he looks sideways and says, is there blood? Xander thinks it means that Spike already knows about the body and Buffy asks him who did this. Now he says the line about you're glowing and cringes away about you know what I did, which probably means his attack on Buffy or that he got his soul back. And Xander says, boy, he's extra useful today. Because to them, Spike is just raving more and more. Spike now says the lines about everyone's talking to him, no one's talking to each other. And when he says the thing about someone isn't there and his money's on the witch, Xander and Buffy are shocked. They were about to leave and now they turn around. And Spike follows up with something we didn't hear. Red's a bad girl. Buffy thinks this means he's pinpointing Willow for the murder, and Xander, very sarcastic, says, and that means something because he's chock full of sanity. Consistent with his previous take on this, and I I really like Xander a lot in this episode. He is the voice of reason, he's loyal to his friend, and he adds perspective. Buffy says, maybe he saw her. Spike now turns to Willow and says, they think you did it, the Slayer and her boy. They think you took the skin. Buffy says, is something here, something that killed? And Xander says, her boy? I'm her boy? Spike, very serious, now says, I have to go. There are things here without permission. I have to check their slips. Make sure they have authorization. A nice bookend for the scene with Willow started with him saying she needed a permission slip and now he is ending the scene with Buffy and Xander that way. Another thing that makes it work so well. There's also a reference in here, another that I did not catch, that is on the Buffy fandom wiki that when Spike is saying to Buffy, you glow, what's another word for glowing? It has to rhyme, references that scene forever ago when Spike was still human and was in love with Cecily and was trying to write that poem looking for something to rhyme with effulgent, which means glowing. This fits with something Whedon said, and I don't know if I referenced this in the regular podcast episode or the Patreon bonus I did about lessons, but Whedon said when you write a character who is raving, the raving still needs to make a certain amount of sense. It has to have an internal logic, and here it does. It makes complete sense that Spike would recall that at one point he was looking for a word for a poem that meant glowing. 
At 19 minutes, 11 seconds, Willow goes to Anya's apartment to ask for help. Interesting, because we had that thing about, will anyone ask for help? And now Willow is doing just that. She walks right into the apartment when Anya opens the door, and Anya says, come in, enjoy my personal space. Willow tells Anya she found a dead body, it was skinned, and both of them say to the other very seriously, was it you? And they both exclaim, no. So well done, just enough. They overlap but aren't speaking simultaneously so that it feels very, very real. Anya points out that the others will think Willow did it because of the skinning. And Willow is really distraught and says she knows and she just needs to do something right and asks for help. And Anya says, is it difficult or time consuming? At last, she agrees to help Willow do a spell. They sit across from each other with a mat between them and powder in their hands. This is the spell, it seems, that Willow tried with Tara way back to look for demons. Tara subverted it because she thought she was part demon. And in another reference to the Willow and Tara magic as metaphor for their attraction to each other, Anya says, this isn't going to get all sexy, is it? And Willow says, I'd be shocked. Anya worries it'll hurt the carpet. Lights show on the map for demons all over Sunnydale. There are a ton of them over where the Hellmouth is. Anya gives a little wave to herself. And at 21 minutes, four seconds, the map bursts into flame, probably from that clump of demons over the Hellmouth. This is right around the midpoint of the episode. And here often we see a major reversal for the protagonist or a major commitment. And this could seem like a major reversal. It, it is one because Willow's spell has gone awry. Anya's pretty angry about that carpet being burned because she will have to pay the security deposit. And it seems that there is no help for Willow at all. It's also a bit of a reversal for Buffy as protagonist because maybe this spell would have helped Willow defeat the demon. But the next moment, Willow pinpoints a spot on the burnt out map where the demon might be. She says it's near enough to where it happened, but it's in the woods out of the way and there are caves there. Anya thinks that's not much to go on. A nice way to have a character say what the audience might be thinking. And Willow says that's why Anya should just teleport over there real quick and check. Anya reveals she can't. She is restricted to using teleporting for vengeance business only because she undid a spell last week. She says, well, as it turns out, teleporting isn't a right, it's a privilege. She has to file a flight plan and everything. Anya then confides that vengeance isn't quite as fun as it used to be and that causing pain sounds really cool, but it turns out, and she says, it's really upsetting. Didn't used to be, but now it is. Willow responds, is it like you're scared of losing that feeling again and having it be okay to hurt people? And then you're not in charge of the power anymore because it's in charge of you? Anya answers, well, that was really overdramatically stated, but yeah. That's it. Willow says she gets it. It's a nice moment of connection. And Anya says she wishes it were better for Willow. And then says it did get a little sexy, didn't it? Willow looks a little bit flirty, but she grabs her coat to go find the cave. So now she is making a pretty major commitment because this demon is clearly dangerous. Willow's unsure about how well her magic is working or isn't. And she's going to go by herself. Probably Willow is our protagonist for the demon plot and for the emotional plot, though that works both ways. There's a subplot from Willow's point of view and one from Buffy's, but Buffy doesn't really have a major commitment in this episode, and the reversal is, is kind of by proxy through Willow. Anya asks Willow about doing a spell to find Buffy and Xander. Willow says she already tried, and the spell said Buffy and Xander don't exist. This explains why they don't see each other, they don't hear each other's voices. I am still confused about noises and footsteps on the ladder. And my brain kept grappling with that throughout the episode, Plus, until this watch, 
I didn't really pick up on that Willow said that. I focus more on, oh, her spell didn't work. That sometimes her spells work, sometimes they don't, because we're also seeing that map going up in flames. So I missed that they don't exist for Willow, though obviously we know something is going on there. At the Summer's home, Dawn researches on the computer looking for demons that flay or skin people, and she asks about other search terms like viscera, and Buffy says she knows about viscera. It makes you proud. Buffy isn't optimistic, though. She worries to Xander that they're wasting time because they know who did this. But right then, Dawn finds a demon, Gnarl, that paralyzes victims with its nails, then eats strips of skin from the body it takes hours and it explains why there was no skin at the scene because he eats it she's sure it's this demon because Buffy and Xander never said there were pools of blood by the body and Don very enthusiastic says he laps up the blood you could say it's like his natural beverage Xander says you're terrifying and I enjoy this is the second time in the row when Dawn has been described as scary or terrifying, first by Spike, now by Xander. Buffy says there's a way to track whoever did it because it l must leave minute traces of blood. Xander doesn't know what she's getting at, but Dawn realizes Buffy will be recruiting Spike to help. Interesting that, again, Buffy is going to ask for help. And on top of it from Spike, who she's not feeling super great about, this may be meant to show some growth in our characters. And maybe that's why we had that reference from Dawn. Dawn is talking about season six. Nobody asked for help, which is a good point. Willow didn't for a very long time. Xander didn't, Buffy didn't. But now we see Willow asking for help. We see Buffy asking for help. Spike is raving again as he leads Buffy, Xander, and Dawn through the woods. He stops and points and then says, this is the end of the line. Buffy says, it's a rock cliff. And Xander says, well, give him a break, Buffy. Maybe it's a vicious skin-eating rock cliff. A quick update to let you know that two more of the books in the Writing as a Second Career series are now available as audiobooks. How to Write a Novel, grades 6 through 8. That is for middle school students to walk them through the novel writing process. It's basically the book I wished I would have had in middle school because I started three or four different novels in my spiral notebooks. Yes, that's how long ago it was. And traded them with my friend who was also writing novels, but we had no idea how a novel was supposed to end or how you get from point A to point B. So that is one book. And the other is Creating Compelling Characters from the Inside Out. Both these books are narrated by a digital voice. It is part of an experimental program Amazon offered to some authors. And I had very mixed feelings about trying it because I feel strongly about using human narrators. And I probably will always do that with my fiction. At the same time, it is really expensive to produce an audio book. And when you are going for a narrow market, self-help writing books generally don't end up at the top of the New York Times bestseller list or sell a gazillion copies. It's pretty much not going to justify the production costs. And that means that the books are inaccessible to people who either can't read at all, can't see at all, or who have low vision. I've had readers ask me specifically for audiobooks because they can read, but it's it's really hard for them. So they read one book and say, hey, I wish, I wish you would do audio. For that reason, I tried it to make the books more accessible. I was shocked how well the digital voice put in intonation just based on the structure of the sentences and the phrasing. If you just want to hear what that sounds like, you can click over to writingassecondcareer.com, um, look for those books on writing, and click and listen to the sample, and I think you will be surprised. You can check either of those out at writingassecondcareer.com or check the links in the show notes. Mm -hmm. 
Spike gives Xander a look and says, there's a cave in it. Look. And he glances at Buffy and Don and says, I'm insane. What's his excuse? Spike leaves and we cut to Willow entering the cave. The demon Narl taunts her calling her a shorn lamb and then says poor little lamb all alone as the others enter they don't see willow and narl is sort of in the shadows but they do hear him and probably they think he might be referring to dawn because narl attacks and scratches dawn at 28 minutes 18 seconds she starts becoming paralyzed buffy and xander drag her out and they block the mouth of the cave so the demon can can't escape. Inside, Willow hears these giant stones sliding over the exit. She yells out and the demon laughs. And we cut to a commercial. On return, the demon taunts her that her friends left her all alone as a gifty for him. She tries a spell, but he laughs and says he loves spells. He keeps them as pets. They leave him alone. And then he goes on, no one comes to save you and says her friends want him to have her. That we have heard before, that's the first of repetition of things Narl says, or maybe the second, because he, he repeats a lot. And I get that that is part of the demon. He taunts, he has this sing-song voice, he's very creepy. And at this point, that works fine for me. We're very frightened for Willow. Buffy and Xander drag Dawn home. In the meantime, Narl keeps taunting Willow. He doesn't answer when she asks if her friends were really there and at 30 minutes 16 seconds he slashes willow's stomach and says they were here here they were and there they went she's on the cave floor on her back helpless as he slices away slivers of her flesh to eat and licks the blood ick the ick factor might be more my issue with the gnarl scenes you i'd love to hear from you do you find his taunting repetitive and slow or is it just that I just don't want to keep seeing him eating flesh and licking the blood I don't know why of all the demons on Buffy this one grosses me out the most but it does at 31 minutes 20 seconds Dawn keeps talking through her clenched teeth as they carry her in she's sort of lying straight out, her whole body stiff, but she's saying, watch the head, watch the head, and they put her on the couch. I get that this is played for comedy. I find this distracting too, though, because the the paralysis is not consistent, though the show does try to address that. Buffy researches, first says the paralysis is permanent, but then finds out it only lasts until Narl dies. So they need to go back and kill the demon. Considering how freaked out Buffy was, even last year when she was super disconnected, when Dawn was in danger, it seems weird to me that she and Xander are pretty casual about this. They talk about might Dawn vomit if they leave her alone. She, through clenched teeth, says something about she's not going to vomit or maybe it makes her worry i'm not sure they agree to call anya to watch her there's another scene with narl taunting willow some more eating more skin licking the blood and now we are approaching the last major plot turn it should grow from the midpoint and take the story in another new direction and sometimes it raises the stakes again and it does do all those things here anya comes to the house and first is Concerned that Dawn might be dying, Buffy insists, no, she's just paralyzed. Anya asks how and says there's different kinds. So there is that nod to, you know, why is Dawn not, not really paralyzed? She can still talk and move a little. And she shows them Dawn is poseable, kind of like a Barbie. She doesn't say Barbie, but that's what it makes me think of because she puts her legs straight up and not with the knees bent. Then they sit Dawn up. Buffy eats nuts while they stand around and joke about this. It doesn't feel as funny as it's supposed to because, sure, the book said if they kill the demon, the paralysis will go away. But they don't know there's not another exit to that cave. And Buffy, as a show, has shown us that the books don't always have all the information you need or the characters have a habit of not reading far enough into the book and they're just kind of like, oh, whatever, Dawn's paralyzed. And also, being paralyzed, that is a very frightening thing in itself. It makes it hard for me to go with the humor of it. 
As they grab their weapons at 33 minutes, 20 seconds, Anya mentions kind of casually about helping Willow and that Willow headed out to find the demon and is looking for Buffy and Xander and they might be at a cave. So this is that last major turn. It definitely comes out of Willow seeking Anya's help and getting it and going for the cave. It turns things because they realize Willow might be trapped in the cave with the demon because they blocked her in. And now Buffy's really worried and Anya says, oh, wouldn't it be tragic if you were here being kind of silly with your comically paralyzed sister while Willow was dying? Wonderful Anya line as always putting her finger on what is happening. Buffy insists Anya come with them after Anya corrects them about the demon's name. It's Narl, not the Narl. This leads Buffy to conclude that Anya knows a lot and they could use her. Now we get another moment that's meant to be comic when Buffy puts the remote in Dawn's hand. And this is where not following rules undercuts the humor because while Dawn is talking through clenched teeth, it's been apparent she can't move her limbs or her hands. So popping that remote in doesn't help her at all. Maybe it's not a rules issue. It's a undercut the tension or the tension undercuts the humor. Both undercut each other because Buffy has just realized like Willow might be dying. So they're willing to leave Dawn alone, but she's going to take a moment to do another goofy joke and give Dawn the remote. But again, I'd love to hear from you if you found that funny, if you enjoyed Posable Dawn. That's awesome, and it may be just my sense of humor. We cut back to Narl still eating Willow's skin, taunting her again about her friends abandoning her. Really nothing new here, and it feels a lot like filling time. The scene cuts to the friends running toward the cave. Buffy yells at them to hurry, which feels like filler as well to me. We get a moment of Anya being out of shape. She got so used to teleporting. And we cut back to Willow again with the demon taunting her. And finally, Buffy, Xander, and Anya enter the cave and Buffy attacks Narl. That's at 35 minutes, 20 seconds. Though we just had that last major plot turn, we're already at the climax for the demon plot, which will lead into resolving the emotional subplots as well. The climax is where the antagonist and protagonist have their final confrontation and resolve the main conflict. Anya tells Buffy and Xander that Willow is there. Buffy now gets why they haven't seen Willow and guesses that not seeing Willow is a whole separate issue from the skin-eating monster. Anya yells at Buffy to hit Narl in the eyes. Buffy and Narl fight. Anya kneels by Willow, who still can't see the others, and tells her Buffy's fighting the demon over there, but adds that if they get too close, I'm going to have to run. Anya tells her that her friends didn't leave her alone on purpose. She tries to reassure Willow. She looks very worried, though, seeing Willow's mostly flayed stomach. Buffy stabs Narl's foot to hold him in place, then gouges his eyes out at 36 minutes, 51 seconds. And Xander says, ew, ew, thumbs? I can't believe you did that. We're now at the falling action where a story ties up loose ends, resolves subplots, and in a series moves along series arcs. Anya tells Willow that Buffy killed the demon. John at home falls off the couch as the paralysis wears off. Buffy and Xander stand near where they guess Willow must be. Anya tells them where Willow is and leaves to get help because Willow is badly wounded. Though she can't see her, Buffy talks to Willow, telling her she's glad Willow is back. She doesn't know how bad Willow is hurt. It's very moving. She's very upset. And gradually the spell wears off as Willow is saying how the demon said they left her. And she sees them and says, don't go away. And Willow is in tears and so grateful they are there. It is wonderful to see them reconnect and the emotions are there the actors do a wonderful job another reason it doesn't hit me as hard emotionally as I wanted it to is earlier 
The demon tells her her friends are there and they left. It seems weird that Willow doesn't catch on that just as she can't see them, they can't see her. I get that she would still feel terribly emotionally abandoned. For me, it would be stronger if we knew that Willow got that they didn't know she was there and couldn't see her, but was still afraid that if they could see her, it wouldn't make any difference because that's that's the heart of the emotion there right that the moment she does see them it will be confirmed that they reject her and I think there's probably some way you could get that to come out we had all those scenes where the demon taunts willow and eats her flesh and they're repetitive and instead maybe we could have gotten something telling us that she gets it like oh they couldn't see her this whole time but what if it didn't matter what if when they figure it out they decide to just leave her in there with the demon the next day willow is sitting on a bed in what I recognize as Buffy's room because of that wallpaper that we've seen for all these seasons. For some reason now, it's a twin bed, not Buffy's double or queen bed. This is where if it was not for the Buffy fandom wiki, I would not get at all that, oh, okay, apparently Willow is moving into Buffy's old room. And for some reason, they took the double bed away. Maybe they gave it to Dawn. I don't know. Willow meditates cross-legged on the bed. Buffy stops to talk and notices how hard Willow seems to be working. Willow explains she's using magic from the earth to regrow her skin. Buffy's a little nervous still about Willow's use of magic. Willow is worn out. She rests her back on a pillow against the wall, but she asks Buffy to stay and says she missed them so much when she couldn't find them and Buffy says she missed Willow too this is where the emotion really lands for me every time I watch it I am almost in tears with them and Willow explains she's the one who caused them not to see each other that she did a spell without even realizing it because her fears about her friends rejecting her made her not want to be seen Buffy is a bit spooked that Willow made this happen just by thinking about it and not knowing she was doing it. Willow concedes that she has a ways to go to master her powers. Buffy confesses she suspected Willow did it. And this is maybe even more of a reconnection. Instead of hiding the things Buffy thinks will upset her friends, she is saying, I was afraid you did it. And Willow reassures her that Willow thought she might have done it too. And I couldn't help thinking how much I would have enjoyed knowing that throughout the episode as well. We find out early on that it is a demon who does this. What if we didn't know? And I feel like if I was supposed to catch that it could have been Willow, that's another thing that I just missed. Maybe that first scene with the story spark, we don't actually see the demon. So maybe we are supposed to think it is Willow. For me, though, that sing-song voice, I assume it's a separate demon. I, we've never heard Willow sound just like that. We heard Dark Willow say things like bored now and certainly not sound exactly like herself, but she didn't sound to me like Narl. So I completely missed it if we were supposed to be worried that this was actually Willow doing this. Willow also tells Buffy, who says Xander never thought it for a minute, that yeah, you know, Xander probably did a little. And she points out Xander has the luxury of always believing in Willow and not thinking about those things. Buffy is the slayer and she has to think about things like that. And she says it's okay if Buffy doesn't think Willow can recover from magic. Willow is not sure herself. She then sits up again, though she's still weak, to try to heal. When she says it takes a lot of strength, Buffy volunteers to help. She has so much strength to spare that she's giving it away. The two sit cross-legged facing each other and hold hands and Buffy helps Willow heal. This finishes that reconnecting plot and I love this moment as well. When I think back about the episode, these are the moments I remember. The spike scene in the basement with everyone talking to him and Willow and Buffy reconnecting. And that's why I love the episode 
episode in memory and then I watch it and I'm much more mixed. There are lots of metaphors again here. Sometimes I get frustrated. Certainly season six frustrated me because there wasn't as much of the metaphor. There was a lot more on the nose about dealing with real life directly and not metaphorically. Here we return to metaphor. We have the metaphor of the gang not being as effective fighting the demon because they're separate and their fear of not being able to connect emotionally is shown metaphorically through this spell where they literally can't connect because they don't exist for one another. Willow's fears about not controlling her magic and being rejected manifest in a spell. Then there is the demon flaying Willow after she flayed Warren alive. And I read a commentary, I wish I could tell you where, it was in an essay, an academic essay about Buffy saying that this had to happen because Willow had to be metaphorically punished for what she did to Warren. And while she lives through it, it is a very long process. And that's why we see, uh, we hear first that it can take hours. We know a lot of time passes because Xander and Buffy are joking around with posable Dawn. And we keep returning to Narl again and again, that that is to make the punishment fit the crime. If that was the intent, I'm I'm not sure how well it works because I didn't get it at all until I read that essay. And instead, as I commented, it made the episode feel slow to me. That could be there, whether purposeful or not. It could be in the writer's mind. Like there have to be consequences for Willow. I'm not sure I entirely agree that there's a need for that because I think Willow already is suffering consequences. That is it for this episode. If you want to hear more about Willow's journey, I'm planning a bonus episode for patrons on my theory that she is the most consistently developed character in all of Buffy and the most believable, that her growth and her changes are the most believable of all the characters. And if you want to hear some foreshadowing, stick around in this episode. Thank you to all of you for listening and a special thank you to patrons who support the show. If you're not sticking around for foreshadowing, which does include spoilers, I hope you'll come back in two weeks for season three, episode four, Help, where a Sunnydale High School student named Cassie says she knows she will die in a few days and Buffy tries to save her. Echoing one of Stephen's points in his comment, this episode shows us again how much Dawn is part of the team. She's researching. She finds the demon. She goes with them to the cave, which season six Buffy, no way, would have let Dawn do. So Buffy is really integrating Dawn. And then the season takes this turn with the potentials and Dawn is relegated to the sidelines. And the season does deal with that. There's a moment where Xander acknowledges it. And Buffy is known for taking seasons in different directions, right? We think one character is the big bad and in the middle of the season, it shifts entirely. Or there are big thematic shifts. So it's it's not unusual that Buffy sets up certain things and then goes in a new direction. But I am with Stephen that these episodes set up a lot that it's not just a new direction. It just wasn't necessary at all. That's not the case with Dawn. I like that we do see that Buffy has really followed through. However much I question how she got there with I want to show you the world. I don't, I don't need to protect you like this. She has followed through. She's training Dawn. She's taking Dawn with her. And yet I am disappointed that Dawn does not get to be more a part of the gang. And in fact, in the end, Buffy will try to cut her out completely, try to send her away. I completely get why Buffy would do that. But it does make some of this feel not unnecessary, but like a deliberate mislead. That being said, I love the episode where Dawn thinks that she is one of the potential slayers and has to step 
back and recognize that she is not and she will not be playing as much of a vital role. And this episode and the previous one explain why she thinks that could be true. Another thing from the BuffyFandom.com wiki, it points out that during that spell, the area on the map with all the lit up demons is an early indication of the first evil's army of Turacans within the Hellmouth. So those ancient vampires that we'll find out are underground, I guess, that Buffy is going And when Buffy and the potentials open up that seal, they all come rushing out. So the fandom wiki said that is what those demon lights are on the map. And and I think that's and I think that's probably right. And I never picked up on that. So that is really fun. It is a great foreshadowing. And whether you get it or not, it emphasizes that idea that the Hellmouth is a huge issue in this season that there's a lot that is going to go on there. There is Xander saying, ew, thumbs when Buffy kills Narl. And later in the season, Caleb, who is the main agent of the first that is active in a physical way, gouges out one of Xander's eyes with his thumb. I'm sure that is not accidental because we want to set up that eyes are vulnerable, that that is a way that you can kill some demons. Willow's fears, of course, are probably the biggest foreshadowing. Not just her fears, but the fact that they are realistic. Willow intends to help people with her magic but she accidentally does something that almost gets her killed that almost gets dawn paralyzed for life and it comes out of her emotions so she is not where she needs to be yet with controlling her magic or with dealing with all those emotional issues and that is one of the things i really love about this episode it sets that up so well And we see that Willow reconnects with Buffy, and yet both Buffy and Willow remain wary because Willow is not done with her training. Anya's issues with being a vengeance demon are key here because in a couple more episodes, she will slaughter those frat boys and make a choice to not be a vengeance demon anymore. So that is set up. We buy that Anya makes that choice. She tells Willow here that she now finds vengeance upsetting. And Willow's speech that Anya calls over dramatic, looking at it knowing what's coming, it is like that. The power in Anya takes her over. She also is not controlling it when she kills those frat boys because she is overwhelmed with the emotion, the way they treat this girl, what they say to her. And though she has, as we heard her friend Hallie say, not really been hurting people very much, she slaughters them. It does seem like it is exactly what Willow says in this episode. And that also sets up Anya doesn't want to have this power anymore. Even when she thinks it means she's going to have to give up her own life. That is it for foreshadowing and for the episode. Thank you again for listening. Come back in two weeks for season seven, episode four, Help which does make use of the high school setting because Buffy discovers a student's life is in danger and enlists Dawn's help in saving her. You can find back episodes of Buffy and the Art of Story as well as the Buffy and the Art of Story books and all my fiction at lisalily.com. To support the podcast, hear extra bonus content and get each regular episode a few days early, join the Patreon community at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lily. That's L-I-S-A. M is in Marie. L-I-L-L-Y. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman LLC. Copyright 2024. All rights reserved.